Hey team, how's it going? Jack here, and in the last two videos, I gave you a 30,000 foot view of the TH2 response. What does it do generally? Then I told you how TH2 responses are induced. Um, so how do we actually make a TH2 cell occur? Now I'm gonna go over what happens once it's activated, and this is where the rubber meets the road. So let's just jump into it. Mm. Hello? Okay. So like I said, all, all T helper cells are a bit like a neuron. They're a bit like a computer. They evaluate all the signals that are going on in the extracellular space, and then they compute that into a rather more simple output, right? So they're sort of doing this information processing. What is um, What are the cytokines being released? What are the antigens I'm being exposed to? Where, what time point are we in the pathology? What was the dose of the pathogen? How much pathogen did we get? So they do all that computation in order to initiate the response. And I will say that I do simplify all of this. There, it is way more complicated, but this is just some of those key main strokes uh, so you understand the fundamental foundation of what's happening. So we've got um, our T cell receptor activation and we've got our IL-4 receptor activation. And the TH2 cell has uh, starts to begin to secrete cytokines. Now, two of the main cytokines released in a TH2 response are IL-4 and IL-5. Now, you'll notice that's a bit weird, right? IL-4 caused the TH2 response, and now the TH2 cell is producing IL-4. Well, you actually see a lot of this in immunology. It's a positive feedback loop. So a little bit of one cytokine will cause more of that cytokine, which will cause more of that cytokine. And it's a way for the body to ensure a certain response is happening, right? If you want a TH2, if you want a predominant TH2 response, you want more and more of the signals that generate a TH2 response to be produced. So you have that positive feedback loop. A really good example is almost all, all of the really like keystone major inflammatory cytokines like IL-1 or TNF-alpha induce the production of more IL-1 and TNF-alpha, right? And you can kind of see it like the immune response is exponential, isn't it? We 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 typically uh, build it up, right? So inflammation starts to happen and it grows bigger and it grows bigger and it grows bigger, right? We And that is perfect for mounting something to overcome a pathogen, right? Bacteria could be dividing exponentially as well. So we need an immune system that can really amplify its response in an exponential fashion to deal with this pathogen. So these positive feedback loops really help allow exponential responses. You know, two IL-4 molecules will induce four IL-4 molecules, which will induce eight IL-4 molecules. And pretty soon you end up with billions of IL-4 molecules floating around your blood. And then the other cytokine, which is really important, is IL-5. So let's jump into what those cytokines do. Right, now you've actually already met these when I talked about B cells in a previous video. So if you remember, B cells need three signals um, in the simplified model uh, in order to activate, proliferate, and produce antibodies. One, they need their B cell receptor activated, which only recognizes a single antigen, which is ideally a pathogenic antigen. They also then phagocytose that pathogen and display some antigen on the MHC2 molecule, and that too must be detected by a TH cell. So we need this to occur here. We need this stage number two. And then if this happens, then the TH cell will produce IL-4, which will bind to the IL-4 receptor over here. And then that will activate the B cell. So one of the first things that happens is these cytokines produced by a TH cell induce the activation, proliferation, and antigen production in B cells. So yes, we're gonna IL-4 activated um, we're going to IL-4 activated B cell, and what we're going to see is we're going to see this proliferation, and some of those will just be memory cells, which are genetically identical to this guy, so they will produce the exact same antibody, um, but they don't go on to become active. What they do is they just hang out and wait for, uh, and so then there are more of them around should we be exposed to that antigen again, so it'll speed up our immune response the second time. And the second thing that happens is we get... Um, 
Effector cells, B cell effector cells, also known as plasma cells. These guys have a larger cytoplasm full of rough endoplasmic reticulum, and that's so they can produce antibodies. Now, in the case of an IL-4 TH2 response, these antibodies are a subtype called IgE, and I will go into that a little bit later. But how I remember it <laughs> is these antibodies are also really important for allergies. So I always say IgE is an allergy allergy e response which is a bit tough but yeah anyway okay so that's um uh the memory the memory cells typically hang out in the lymph nodes whereas the effector cells or the plasma cells uh flow around the plasma funny enough um and so they can be detected in the blood um but what does ige go on and do and ige antibodies play a really important response in the basophil and eosinophil response. So I just wanted to briefly introduce these guys. So these are the granular sites of the blood, right? If we talk about white blood cells, um, we talk about granular sites, and then we talk about mononucleated cells like monocytes, and then we talk about lymphocytes, right? Um, so we've got monocytes, lymphocytes, and granulocytes. That's typically how we break it down. Um, and the granular sites are full of granules, right? So we've met the neutrophil. Its granules are full of neutrophil elastase um, and uh, MPO, myeloperoxidase, which produces bleach. So it's typically bactericidal. That's the number one thing uh, neutrophils do, but they're also viricidal and parasite killing. But that's the main role is, is bacteria and fungi, for example. Um, basophils, their granules are full of uh, mostly inflammatory signaling molecules, in particular histamine, right? So they're not sort of a responder. They're not actually dealing with the pathogen typically directly. They're actually coordinating a more of a vascular, anatomical, and inflammatory response. And eosinophils, they contain antiparasite granules. And a really good clue that they're antiparasite is that the granules actually contain, um, they contain a lot of similar stuff to neutrophils, um, stuff that produces reactive oxygen species and digestive enzymes like elastase, but they also contain neurotoxins, right? Now, neurotoxins aren't going to do anything to bacteria or viruses or fungi, but they will do something to complex organs, organisms like worms, which do have a, neuro, uh, a nervous system. So there's a really good clue. There's like very convincing evidence about what an eosinophil does. Um, because the granules contain anti um, uh, contain neurotoxins to kill those worms, so obviously they're going to be very important in the Th2 response. Um, and another important cell, but it, it doesn't flow around the blood, um, is a mast cell. And mast cells are full of granules, and those granules also contain histamine. So, uh, uh, um, as an overly simplified way to describe a mast cell is that it's a within tissue basophil. It's something that lives inside the tissue. Um, it does a lot, a little bit, a lot more different things than what basophils do. But a really good way to think about it is it's just a within tissue basophil. It's full of histamine, just like a basophil is. And since we're doing flow cytometry, and since I've got a whole bunch of videos on flow cytometry, I thought I'd just quickly tell you how to break them apart. And in doing that, uh, telling you how to detect them using flow cytometry. Um, you will also learn some of their functions uh, in the Th2 response. So here we have whole blood, and um, we've got the mononuclear cells there and the polo, uh, poly uh, uh, nuclear cells there, the granular sites up here. And so we've got side scatter and forward scatter here. So we can see there are some cells here with a lot of side scatter. Now, side scatter typically means granular site because it's measuring the complexity of the cell. Now we've got some gating here, and they've gated at PMN and MNC, right? So um, polymorphonuclear cells in PMN and mononuclear cells in MNC. So if we if we draw a circle around here, that's called a gate, and we say I'm only going to let those cells go down to this graph, right? So only these cells have gone down to this graph here, and you can see that the side scatter, which is around 800 stays around 800 on this graph. And so this is called a gate. It's only these cells are being let through the gate down to here. Now on the y-axis, we've still got side scatter. 
but on the x-axis we've got the interleukin-5 receptor so this is an antibody that will bind to the interleukin-5 receptor and fluoresce so then we can measure that fluorescence with the lasers in the flow cytometry machine and we would be able to distinguish two different populations now remember the th2 cell is producing interleukin-5 the inflammatory uh the um inflammatory antiparasite cytokine and il5 the il5 receptor is only found on eosinophils so now if we draw a circle around these guys they have they're very granular so they've got a high side scatter and they've got the il5 um, receptor so they are eosinophils and then if you actually sort those cells and look at them you can see that they have that eosinophil um like h and e stain signature um, the non-IL-5 recepting high granular site uh, cells, if we go up here, they're neutrophils. And look, when we sorted them and looked at them, they were neutrophils, right? So the gaining strategy is working fantastically. Now, here's where it gets a bit interesting, right? Now, you see this is kind of smeared here. There's a lot of cells here. And then there's a few cells over there with a little bit higher, um, so, uh, a little bit higher forward scatter signature. Now, if we take that um, over to here, um, if we only let these cells through the gate over to here, we find an interesting thing. We thought these were the non-complicated cells because they're not the granular sites, um, but we, we see that um, we've got these IL-5 recepting cells there, and so these cells also contain the IL-5 receptor. So eosinophils had the IL-5 receptor, these cells here also contain the IL-5 receptor. And then when we look at them, we see that they're basophils. But that's uh, a little bit confusing, right? Because they um, are granular size, so they should have appeared up here as very complex. Well, it's interesting that basophils um, uh, do not scatter as much light as the other granular sites. They're quite a low side scatter granular site. Um, and uh, it seems to be do, to do with they seem to have fewer and less densely packed granules than the other two, uh, but they are full of granules. They just have lower, uh, a lower side scatter signature, which is a little bit complex, but quite interesting. So the IL-5 positive cells that have a lower side scatter are basophils, and the IL-5 positive cells that are, have a really high side scatter are eosinophils. And if they don't have the IL-5 receptor down here, then they are neutrophils. And if they um, don't have any of IL-5 and they've got low side scatter, they're probably a lymphocyte or a monocyte. So these guys here are lymphocytes or monocytes, and these guys here are probably red blood cells because they're very small. Um, yeah, cool. So that's how to distinguish those cells. How do they fit into the Th2 response? Well, let's jump into it here. So let's look at mast cells and basophils because they have a lot in common. Uh, what happens when their IL-4 receptor is activated? So um, we know they've got the IL-4 and the IL-5 receptor. Let's just have a look at what happens when the IL-4 or 5 receptor is activated. We, the first thing we see is proliferation. We get massive proliferation of these cells. And then we also get hypergranulation. So we actually get production of more granule cells. And we also get the production of a receptor called an FC receptor, right? Um, and FC receptors bind to antibodies that have recognized an antigen. And that's really important. So these FC receptors will bind to the IgE antibodies that were produced by B cells. So we get priming, we get um, we, we essentially get proliferation and priming, which includes the increased granularity, increased production of histamine, and increased production of the FC receptor. Now let's look at eosinophils. Let's um, see what happens when the IL-5 receptor is activated. So when the IL-5 receptor is activated on an eosinophil, we get proliferation again, and we also get hypergranulation. Um, now remember the and as well as extra production of the FC receptors. Now the granules, remember, they contain cytotoxic and neurotoxic compounds. So unlike the basophils and marthels, where the granules contain signaling molecules, the eosinophil granules contain cytotoxic and neurotoxic compounds. Now I mentioned here IgE. What do I mean by that? Well, there's actually a number of antibody subtypes. And we're going to go into much greater detail in a later video about antibody subtypes. 
So, but I really just wanted to bri briefly into, uh, introduce all the, the main antibody subtypes. So antibodies are called Ig, immunoglobulin, and then they're labeled G, E, D, A, M. Now you can rearrange that to something like gamed, is how I remember it, G, A, M, E, D, gamed. Um, uh, or you can come up with your own acronym there. Here I've got GEDAM. Ah, oh, damn, those are good uh, antibodies. Right, so I'm going to briefly introduce roughly what they do, and this is super, super rough, um, but it, it gives you a good anchor point to uh, anchor a lot of details on. So IgG is the antibody. When we talk about antibodies in the blood binding to viruses, we're talking about IgG. IgG is the super dude that helps cure you of those bloodborne pathogens and tissue pathogens. IgE, I call it the allerge E antibody because this is what's um, this is what's critical in allergies, and we will learn why that is. But the other thing IgG, IgE is really good for is um, parasites. So IgE is the allergy antibody as well as the parasite antibody. Um, IgD is most famous for being the majority of B-cell receptors. So when we have that picture of a B-cell with an antibody on the cell surface embedded in the membrane of the antibody, typically that's an IgD antibody. That's what the IgD um, antibody is famous for. It's typically a receptor, but it is also, you know, everything does everything, so it's also secreted and so on. Now, IgA is the mucus antibody. It's it's produced uh, by B cells and then transported um, through the mucosal cells into the mucus when, wherever there's production of mucus. It will be full of IgA. And IgM is the early antibody. So it does very similar things to IgG. It is kind of the antibody, but IgM is typically produced first. And there's a, a, a subtle difference in affinity where IgG is the, has the highest affinity and it's the best antibody at getting rid of things like blood-borne pathogens. Uh, but when it comes to the, uh, yeah, when it comes to the uh, parasite response, these are the main guys, but in particular IgE and IgA are the main guys in this response. Uh, so let's have a let's have a look. What what have what 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 were those FC receptors that I was talking about on eosinophils, basophils, and mast cells? Well, FC receptors are a range of receptors that actually recognise antibodies, and they recognise antibodies once they're bound typically to their antigen. So let's compare a couple of cells here. We've got macrophages. Well, we've got mass basophil and eosinophil cells. Now they have two dif different kinds of e FC receptors, and those FC receptors recognize different antibodies. So the macrophage um, FC receptor recognizes the antibody, the IgG, and so uh, upon activation of the macrophage FC receptor by an anti antibody that's recognized as antigen, we will get phagocytosis, right? So um, that is part of the opsonization process, right? The IgG has helped the macrophage recognize that pathogen in phagocytosa. Whereas IgE is associated with parasites. Um, and so here we have some smaller parasites here. Um, and so the antibody is bound to this parasite and the IgE will be recognized by the mast cell, the basophil, or the eosinophil FC receptor, and this will result in degranulation. And in the case of mast cells and basophil cells, that's the release of inflammatory signaling molecules, in particular histamine. But in the case of eosinophil cells, that's the release of cytotoxic and neurotoxic compounds. So um, here's another example we might have. We might have a giant worm that's secreting that mucus and an antibody will bind to that mucus and then the FC receptor will recognize that binding of that, the, anti, the IgE that is bound to the mucus and then it will cause degranulation. So histamine, um, unlike other cytokines, is pre, uh, unlike cytokines and other inflammatory signaling molecules, histamine is pre-synthesized and it's packed into those granules, which makes it a bit different to um, cytokines, which are typically produced on demand. Um, 
And uh, the importance of that is it allows us to re have a huge response really quickly because it's got package, um, it's got uh, package signaling molecules, loads of it in these granules. Um, it's in mast cells and basophils, and degranulation is signaled by calcium flux. So um, uh, all cells uh, are typically low in calcium, and the extracellular environment is high in calcium. Some people re remember this by saying that cells are like a banana in a swimming pool full of table salt. So the extracellular fluid is the, um, uh, sorry, a swimming pool of milk with table salt. So the extracellular fluid is the milk filled with table salt. So it's got sodium, chloride, and calcium. Whereas the cell is like the banana in that swimming pool, pool of milk and table salt. And so it is high in potassium. So uh, what if you want to do something fast in your body, it often involves what's called calcium influx, right? So uh, the cell is very low in calcium, just like a banana. And so if you poke, um, if you open a pore in that cell, calcium will flood in from the extracellular space, space and, endure, and, and induce a very fast response. So muscle contraction is signaled by calcium flux. Neuronal signal, signaling, very important parts of that are signaled by calcium flux, and degranulation is signaled by calcium influx. So you create a pore in that membrane, calcium floods in, that tells the granules to fuse to the outer cell membrane and release their contents. Now, this histamine response is a major cause of um, allergy responses. And you think about how fast that is. If you eat something you're allergic to, you immediately have this swell, 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 swelling response and you immediately have this allergy response. And that's because degranulation, calcium flux, this is all a very fast response. If IgE binds to the antibody, that's recognized by the FC receptor and suddenly we get this massive allergic response. Now the swelling is caused by the blood becoming permeable, the blood um, vessels becoming permeable, and so now fluid just floods into the extracellular space, causing that swelling, which can be dangerous if it's in airways. So here we can see histamine um, is signaling this vasodilation, the leakiness of the blood vessel, and infiltration of inflammatory cells here. So now let's try to put this all together because it seemed like uh, I, I went through a lot and I went through it rather quickly. So let's take a big picture look at it here. Here we have an intestine, right? So this is an intestine and these are what's called villi um, in the intestine here. They increase the surface area so we can absorb food in our intestine. And here we have a worm. We've got a parasite. It's released. It's... um. It's secretions which have been recognized by an antigen presenting cell and now we've got a TH2 response occurring. So what happens in that TH2 response? So we've got a, we've got a T cell down here. Now the anatomy of this um, is very broad strokes but we've got our T cell and it's releasing cytokines, IL-4 and IL-5 which is causing the proliferation and priming of mast cells, basophils and eosinophils. And it's also causing B cells to produce antibodies. So now we've got our B cells here, and they're producing IgA, which is being secreted into the mucus. Now, this is one way I remember this, and I've got to apologize for this, but IgA is secreted often into the intestine, but it is also in other secretions. Um, but IgA is often secreted into the intestine, so it will ultimately come out of your anus. So IgA is the anus antibody. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, but rude words help you remember things. So IgA is the anus antibody. And so the secreted IgA will eventually go out your anus. Anyway, so IgA is secreted into the intestinal lumen, into the mucus, your own mucus that you're producing, right? Um, and IgE as well is going to go out and bind to that mucus um, that's being produced by the worm. Now, these um, antibodies, IgE is going to, um, which is the allergy antibody, is going to activate your mast cells and basophils via that FC receptor. So the mast cells and basophils are getting activated uh, by IgE binding to an antigen and then binding to your FC receptors on your mast cells and basophils, and that's gonna cause 
degranulation. So that's going to produce histamine, right? And histamine is going to break down um, your uh, your blood vessel. Uh, your blood vessels are going to become permeable, breaking those bonds, um, the tight junctions between your endothelial cells. So fluid is now going to rush into your intestine. And histamine is also going to initiate an anatomical response, which is peristalsis, the contraction of the intestine to force stuff along it, right? So we're going to get this massive production of mucus. We're going to secrete a bunch of fluid in there. And so that's going to cause diarrhea through peristalsis and secretion of fluid. And that's going to help us get rid of those parasites. Now we've got a, a, an eosinophil here, which is quite a badass guy because it's got neurotoxins and cytotoxic compounds, and it's being activated by the IgE antibody on the FC receptor. So um, it's, start, it's starting to, um, uh, it's, uh, it will recognize that and degranulate, which will produce its neurotoxic compounds as well as its cytotoxic compounds to help kill this worm. Sorry, my video uh, cut out there. So uh, let me just start this last final spiel right now. Here we go. So we have a Th2 cell producing IL-4 and IL-5, which is signaling to the B cells to pump out antibodies, IgE, IgA, which is activating the mast cells and basophils to produce histamine, which is causing massive um, uh, cell recruitment and secretion of mus mucus and peristalsis. We've got eosinophils responding to the IgE antibodies through the FC receptor. So they are now pumping out cytotoxic and neurotoxic compounds. And then the mucus and the cytotoxic neurotoxic compounds, as well as the antibodies, which are coating the parasite, as well as the peris peristalsis, which is help flushing the, the uh, pathogen out of the intestine all end up killing or flushing out that parasite from your intestine. Now we'll say uh, the parasite doesn't go down easy and it releases a whole bunch of cytokines, uh, a whole bunch of uh, biologically mo modifying molecules that modify our response and they actually block our immune response. And an interesting uh, result of this is that Worms actually suppress the Th2 response with some of the chemicals that they release. And because the Th2 response is part of our allergy response, having intestinal worms actually reduces your allergy response. And so there's been very famous papers where authors have reported that um, if being infected with an intestinal worm helps prevent hay fever. And actually the authors then admitted that they gave themselves intestinal worms because they felt that having um, uh, these intestinal worms were specifically designed to not lay eggs um, in, your, in your rectum so they didn't have some of those negative symptoms that comes with intestinal worms. But they infected themselves with an intestinal worm so it would block the TH2 responses so it would block the allergies and that was to help prevent them from having hay fever. I don't know how I would sleep at night knowing that I've got intest uh, worms in my intestine, but it's an interesting fact nonetheless. And pretty much whenever I talk about something that your immune system does to get rid of a pathogen, you could guess that there's a pathogen blocking that response. Pathogens are very smart and they produce chemicals to help inhibit these TH2 responses or any response that attempts to fight them and sometimes that comes with hidden benefits. But I would just end by saying that it's way more complicated than what I just said. So um, uh, everything I've said in all these videos is way, way more complicated. There's like dozens upon dozens of cytokines involved. There's whole cell types that I'm missing out here. Um, and uh, there's a number of molecular processes going on. It's infinitely complex and infinitely diverse depending on the pathogen. In particular, TH2 responses are also important in our viral response and are very important in our antibacterial response. And I'll go into that later when I start talking about vaccination, because when we vaccinate, we want to make sure we get the right levels of TH1 and TH2 responses. It's not just, oh, it's a virus, we only want a TH1 response. Sometimes you want a bit of both. So, um, Yes, it's all complicated, but it, this gives you a good anchor, a good foundation on which more knowledge can be built should you want to investigate the details of these responses um, later on.